Welcome to a scientific presentation looking at the different types of coral reefs in the Caribbean. My name is Paul Blanchon and I'm a reef geoscientist at the National University of Mexico. The main focus of my work is the geological development of modern and quaternary reefs. And in this talk I want to take a new look at some old Caribbean reef types in order to give you a better insight into their geomorphology, the distribution and the factors controlling their development. The talk is based on a recent paper that we published in PLOS One in 2022, which you can find listed in the credits at the end. As we all know, in 1842, Charles Darwin proposed that Indo-Pacific reefs formed an evolutionary sequence where fringing reefs transformed into barrier reefs and then atolls as the volcanic islands subsided. In stage one of this sequence, fringing reefs grow around a gradually subsiding volcanic island and usually form a shallow lagoon close to shore. In stage two, these fringing reefs transform into a barrier reef as vertical reef growth matches the slow subsidence of the island. And in stage three, the barrier turns into an atoll when the central island eventually subsides below sea level. Now this sequence isn't completely accurate because Darwin didn't know about the glacial oscillations of sea level that occurred during the last two million years. And so during the Pleistocene, sea level is the main driver of this reef sequence, not subsidence. I've shown how these glacial sea level oscillations impact reef development in a previous paper and YouTube video, which are listed in the credits at the end. But regardless of how we actually get there, the sequence is correct, and fringing reefs do indeed transform into barriers and atolls through time. In addition to this sequence, Darwin also claimed that the surface of these three reef types seemed identical, stating that the principal kinds of coral reefs differ little as far as it relates to the actual surface of the reef. An atoll differs from a barrier reef only in the absence of land within its central expanse, and a barrier reef differs from a fringing reef in being placed at a greater distance from the land and in the presence of a deep water lagoon. So the only difference he saw between them was in the lagoon depths and the distance from shore. In other words, he implied that there's really only one type of reef, with three stages of development. After identifying the three reef stages around the Indian and Pacific Oceans, Darwin turned his attention to the Caribbean, where unfortunately things didn't go as well. On his 1842 reef map, which you can see here, he was only able to identify the fringing reef stage and marked neither barrier reefs nor atolls. His reason was because Caribbean reefs looked different from those in the Indo-Pacific. Those that look most like barriers, such as in Belize, were composed mostly of sandbanks, whereas those that look most like atolls, such as Bermuda, were encircled only by patch reefs. So it seemed to him that Caribbean reefs were less well developed than their Indo-Pacific cousins, and that this probably stemmed from the lack of widespread subsidence in the area. So let's put ourselves in Darwin's shoes for a moment to appreciate the difficulties that he faced. Let's use atolls as an example and compare the differences between Indo-Pacific and the Caribbean. There are several definitions you can find in the literature and these are all quite similar, suggesting that atolls are circular breakwater reefs that surround and enclose lagoons with no landmass. In the case shown here from the Maldives, you can see that the reefal rim makes up 95% of the perimeter, so it clearly encloses most of the lagoon. You can also see that the reef forms a well-developed breakwater on all sides. Now let's compare this to the Caribbean and look at four examples which previous workers have claimed to be atolls. Hogstai, Alacran, Chinchorro and Glovis. The first example is Hogstai Reef in the Bahamas which you can see here. In this case the breakwater reef rim encloses a good 83% of the lagoon and the reef forms a breakwater on all sides. So it's very comparable to Indo-Pacific atolls and it could easily be classified as an atoll. The next candidate is Alacranis on the Campeche bank in the Gulf of Mexico. Here the reef rim only forms 53% of the perimeter and so barely encloses half of the lagoon. And the other sides are rimmed by submerged sandbanks and patch reefs, not a breakwater reef. So is this comparable to atolls in the Indo-Pacific? I would tend to agree with Darwin and say no, and suggest instead that it's actually a, a barrier reef with an open lagoon that's fairly deep in places. Next is Chancharo Bank in the Mexican Caribbean, 
Again, the reefal rim is only 51% of the perimeter, and the other half is rimmed by submerged sandbanks and patch reefs, not breakwater reefs. So is it comparable to Indo-Pacific atolls? Again, I don't think so, and suggest it's actually a fringing reef that fronts a shallow submerged bank. Finally, there's Glover's Reef in Belize, which seems to be the perfect example of a Caribbean atoll. In this case, the breakwater reef rim encloses 72% or about three quarters of the lagoon, and the other quarter is a mixture of patch reefs and sandbanks. So does the reef fully enclose, enclose the lagoon? No, but it's certainly close. In my opinion, Glover's is a borderline case and classifying it requires us to first standardize the definition of atolls before we can say either way. Darwin didn't know what to think either. He stated that the Belize reefs have so completely the form of atolls that if they had occurred in the Pacific, I should not have hesitated about coloring them blue. So this quote gives us a better insight into his motives and he implies that atolls and barriers can't form in the Caribbean because of a, the general lack of subsidence. So he's essentially resorting to a confirmation bias, or in other words, excluding things that don't fit into his perceived theory of reef development. But despite his bias, we can see that Darwin was right. There is significant uncertainty about the classification of atolls in the Caribbean. And the same goes for barrier reefs and to a lesser extent fringing reefs too because significant differences do exist between Caribbean reef types and their Indo-Pacific counterparts. So this uncertainty leads us to, to ask some fundamental what, where and how questions. First, what reef types exist in the Caribbean? Second, where do they occur? And third, how are they different from each other? So in the rest of the talk, I want to address and try and resolve these three questions. Let's start with the first question. What reef types exist in the Caribbean? To answer this, we need two things. First, we need a reef classification system that standardizes each reef category so it's easy to recognize. And second, we need to count and classify all reefs in the Caribbean using this scheme. So first, for the classification, there are two main objectives to bear in mind. The first is to design a classification that conveys an accurate mental image of the physical character of each reef type in order to provide better communication. And the second objective is to impart order in natural systems that are almost always dominated by continuous variables. So in other words, we're erecting artificial boundaries where none really exist. So a classification scheme which satisfies these objectives should be fairly straightforward and rely upon observable descriptive criteria to establish the categories. And second, where possible, these descriptive criteria should be chosen to impart significant information regarding the genesis of those categories. So here is the classification scheme we're proposing. It's inclusive and covers all reef types. It provides standardization of size and depth so categories can be e easily distinguished. And it will hopefully allow us to better understand what controls their formation. Now the scheme has four steps or levels that uh, will allow us to classify any reef. The first level is related to the general depth at which the reef develops. The second level is related to the general form of the reef. The third level then places a reef into its maritime setting. And the fourth level distinguishes between a specific type of shallow geomorphology. So let's briefly go through, through these so that you're familiar with the criteria we're using to distinguish between these categories. The first step distinguishes two reef classes based on their depth. Breakwater reefs develop at the water surface, causing waves to break over them, and are therefore intertidal by definition. Submerged reefs, on the other hand, develop below the surface and are subtidal and of course, don't cause wave breaking. So we can see breakwater reefs on Google Earth and classify them, but submerged reefs aren't so obvious and you need, ex need exceptional images to see them. So we won't look at this class any further in this talk. The second step divides breakwater reefs on the basis of form and they're split into either linear or dispersed categories. Linear breakwater reefs are typically well organized 
and have linear or curvilinear forms consisting of the four main types we're all familiar with fringing reefs, barrier reefs, furrows and atolls. Fringing reefs are standardised to have lagoons shallower than 10 metres depth whereas barrier reef lagoons are standardised to be 10 metres or deeper. Pharaohs are standardised to have a diameter of less than 5 kilometres and the breakwater reef must enclose 75% or more of the lagoon whereas atoll diameters are standardised to be 5 kilometres or more and again the reef must enclose at least 75% of the lagoon. So to define these four reef types all you need to know is water depth, diameter and how much of the lagoon is enclosed by the reef. The other group in the breakwater reef class are dispersed reefs and these consist of less regular or non-linear forms that tend to cover large areas. They're composed of either fields of patch reefs or networks of ridges and cells and are best known from lagoons but we've also found them in open water covering coastal shelves and offshore banks. We're still working on standardizing this reef class but so far we've identified four main types. The first are granular reefs which are composed of fields of uniformly spaced patch reefs. Second are lobular reefs which are fields of patch reefs that are merged into lobe-like forms. Third are reticular reefs which are fields of sinuous or branched ridges. And fourth are cellular reefs which are fields of ridges arranged into a network of cells. And like I said we're still working on this class so today we'll only concentrate on classifying the linear breakwater reefs. The third step divides linear breakwater reefs according to the four main maritime settings. First are interior reefs which occur in enclosed lagoons or bays that are protected from open ocean swell and storm waves. Second are coastal reefs which occur on narrow shelves less than five kilometers wide that border the mainlands or islands. Third are bank reefs which occur on either shelves wider than five kilometers or offshore banks. So an example of a wide shelf would be the Campeche Bank in the Gulf of Mexico and an example of an offshore uh, bank would be the Bahama Banks or Chinchorro Bank. And the fourth would be oceanic reefs which occur in deep sea areas where there are no shelves and the sea floor quickly slopes into waters greater than 200 meters deep. So these are the four main maritime settings and really all we've done is to standardize the difference between narrow and wide shelves in distinguishing coastal from bank settings. The fourth and final step divides linear breakwater reefs according to their shallow geomorphology and there are two main types. First there are flat type reefs which have a back reef zone that is an intertidal flat and second there are crest type reefs which have a back reef that is a subtidal slope which extends from the reef crest and slopes back into the lagoon. And there are several ways you can distinguish between them. Flat types for example are so shallow that they block almost all wave energy and this allows vegetated islands to form in the back reef zone and for lagoons to fill up with mangrove. In some cases it even causes the entire shoreline to advance seawards and merge with the back reef. Another way to identify an intertidal reef flat is that wave breaking over the crest produces shallow wave trains that continue into the back reef. On crest types by contrast no such features are found and instead they have deeper back reef zones where wave breaking at the crest produces strong currents that remove sediment and allow patch reefs to develop. So these two types show significant differences in their shallow geomorphology. If we count the number of reef categories that these four steps produce, you get a maximum total of 32 linear breakwater reef types. And if you break this down and count the number of reef types in each maritime setting, you get 10 types of interior reef, 8 types of coastal reef and 8 types of bank reef, and 6 types of oceanic reef. These numbers are still preliminary because they're only for linear breakwater reefs and the number of types will obviously increase when we get around to including other reef classes like the dispersed and the submerged reefs. But for now this scheme can be applied to breakwater reefs in any ocean in any part of the world. Clearly not all reef types will be present in all areas and we'll see this when we look at data from the Caribbean.
So we have the first requirement, an objective and easy to apply classification. Now we can move on to the hard part, which is counting and classifying all breakwater reefs in the Caribbean. The only feasible way to do this is using Google Earth. This was first launched by Google in 2005 and provides historical images for the last 15 to 20 years. And these allow you to see clear views of roughly 95% of all reefs in the Caribbean. The 5% you can't see basically result from gaps in the coverage of high resolution images, particularly in offshore banks away from population centers. For example, you can't see reefs on the Pedro or Serrania banks on the Nicaragua rise. And there are a few high, high resolution images for much of the barrier reef and atolls off Belize. So Google Earth is pretty good, but not perfect. So what did we find after all the counting and classifying was finished? Well, we found a total of 16 linear reef types with a combined total length of greater than 2,000 kilometers. That's basically the difference from Cancun to Washington, D.C., or from Cancun to Bogota, Colombia. The vast majority of these, some 80%, are fringing reefs, with only 16% being barrier reefs and 4% being pharaohs and atolls. Looking at the settings, we found four reef types in interior settings, but these are quite rare. In coastal settings, we found six types, all of which are fairly common. There are no atolls in this setting because coastal shelves are less than five kilometers wide, which is obviously less than the diameter of the atolls. Only pharaohs can fit on coastal shelves because of their small, smaller dimensions, but we didn't find any. We did find pharaohs in the bank setting, which had a total of six reef types, with only three of those being common. And finally, we found no reef types present in oceanic, oceanic settings. So out of the 16 reef types we, that we found, only nine are common, and these are exclusively in coastal and bank settings. So let's take a quick look at these common reef types to see how they compare. Starting in the coastal setting, we have flat type coastal fringing reefs, and this type forms 33% of all fringing reefs. And there are two categories. The first is attached to the shore with no lagoon, like here at, at San Blas in Panama. And the second is detached from the shore with a narrow lagoon, like here at Mahawal in Mexico. These two flat types have a tendency to cause coastal advance because the shallow reef flat reduces virtually all the wave energy under fair weather conditions. Also in coastal settings, we have crest type coastal fringing reefs, and these form 43% of all fringing reefs, which makes them the most common reef type in the Caribbean. Again, there are two categories. The first is detached from the shore with a narrow lagoon, like here at Ponta Maroma in Mexico. And this detached form is the most common reef type. And the second is attached to the shore with no lagoon, like at Ganavi Island in Haiti. Now these aren't that common and may actually be detached forms where the coastal sediments have advanced into the lagoon in settings that don't have that much wave energy. Fringing reefs also occur in bank settings, which remember are shelves wider than five kilometers or submerged platforms like the Bahama banks. These bank fringing reefs are also very common and form 24% of all fringing reefs. Again, there are two types. The first are flat type bank fringing reefs like this one at Turnefi Atoll in Belize. And in this image you can see a small island on the reef flat and mangrove advancing into the lagoon. And both of these features are typical of flat type reefs because of the drastic reduction in wave energy they produce. And the second are crest type bank fringing reefs like this one near Cayo Cantilles in Cuba. These crest types also reduce incident wave energy but not to the extent that flat types do. So the back reef zone behind the crest are typically characterized by strong wave-induced currents that transport sediment downslope into the lagoon. Barrier reefs are significantly less common than fringing reefs, forming only 16% of all reef types, and they occur in both coastal and bank settings. However, they're not very common in coastal settings, probably due to the terrestrial influences such as flooding and, and frequent turbidity.
but again they occur as both flat and crest types. On the top you can see a coastal flat type at Bay de Caracol in Haiti. This one is about 4 km from shore so it's much better developed. And the coastal crest type below is from Roatan in Honduras and it's right next to the shore and cut by deep channels which have presumably been maintained by river outflow from the mainland. Barrier reefs are much more common however in bank settings away from terrestrial influences. Again there are both flat types and crest types. The flat types like here at Los Roques off the Venezuelan coast show an irregular but very distinctive back reef that results from active sediment transport across the reef flat and into the lagoon. This sediment is channelized and forms mini deltas that extend into the lagoon at regular intervals. The crest types, like here at Southern Long Cay on the Belize Barrier Reef, don't have channelized sediment transport and instead form a more regular boundary backed by lagoonal patch reefs. Ok, so we've classified and counted all reef types in the Caribbean and we've familiarized ourselves with the common types. So now we can move on to the second question. Where do these reef types occur? To answer this question we need two things. First we need to divide the Caribbean into separate zones so that we have some way to see how the distribution changes. And second we then need to count and record what reef types occur within each zone. Dividing the Caribbean into zones has kindly been done by Spalding in 2007 who recognized several faunally distinct ecozones so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Remember the only reason we need to do this visit is to visualize reef distribution so the exact boundaries between ecozones are not that important. There are a total of eight ecozones. The first combines Florida and the Bahamas and the second is the southern Gulf of Mexico. Then the Caribbean below is divided into west, central, east and south with the central and south being halved into east and west ecozones. When you divide reefs up between these ecozones this is what you get. These donut charts show the proportion of reef types by length in each ecozone with the total length of reefs in the middle along with the proportion of the coast they protect. Fringing reefs are in blue, barrier reefs are in orange and pharaohs and atolls are in green. You can see right away that the amount of reef types differs between each ecozone but we'll come back to that in a minute. You can also see differences in the total length of reefs between ecozones. The west ecozone has the highest reef length at nearly 600 kilometers, whereas the Gulf of Mexico south has the lowest at 100 kilometers. The west ecozone and the central east ecozone have the largest number of reef types, with both having 10 out of 16, whereas Florida and the Bahamas, Gulf of Mexico south, and the east ecozones have the lowest with only 4 out of 16. So the west eco region stands out as having the most amount of reefs by length, some 600 kilometers, the most number of reef types, 10 out of 16, and these collectively protect the most amount of coast out of any eco region. If you include the Alacran Reef in the southern Gulf of Mexico, the west eco zone also contains the three longest unbroken reef tracks in the entire Caribbean and Western Atlantic. Alacranis comes in at the longest at 34 kilometers, with Chinchorro and Lighthouse in Belize coming in close behind. So the Mesoamerican Reef isn't the second longest in the world as widely cited, but it is number one in the Caribbean in terms of length, morphological diversity and importance for coastal protection. Ok, so now let's come back and look at the differences in the distribution of reef types. Here you can see the distribution of all fringing reef types and it's immediately clear that they're the dominant reef class in all ecozones, with the only exception being the Gulf of Mexico south, which as we've just seen is dominated by the Alacranes Barrier Reef. In this slide you can see the distribution of barrier reefs in orange and pharaohs and atolls in green. Here what stands out is the complete absence of these reef types in the east ecozone and their rarity in the Florida Bahamas and the two central ecozones. They're really only abundant in the west ecozone, the Gulf of Mexico south and the two south ecozones.
OK, now let's look at the different types of fringing reef. If we look at the distribution abundance of crest type fringing reefs, you can see something very interesting. They're not that common in the east and south ecozones, but dominate in the north and northwest ecozones. If we now look at the distribution abundance of flat type fringing reefs, there's almost an inverse distribution. They're not that common in the north and northwestern ecozones, but dominate in the south and southeast ecozones. The only zones where they overlap to any significant extent are in the east and central east ecozones. OK, let's recap what we've found so far. We found that the Caribbean has a total of 16 reef types, nine of which are common. 80% of these are fringing reefs in coast and bank settings. The most abundant reef type is the detached crest type coastal fringing reef, which forms 43% of all fringing reef types. Finally, although fringing reefs dominate in all areas, flat types are more common in the south and crest types are more common in the north. OK, we've looked at the distribution of reef types. Let's move on to the final and most interesting question of all. How does the geomorphology of these reef types compare? Are they similar to each other and form part of an evolutionary sequence as Darwin claimed, or are they different and form more than one reef type? To resolve these questions, we first need to sample the morphometrics of common reef types so that we can compare the morphologies. And the next thing we need to do is check how much morphological variation exists within each reef type so that we can identify reefs with distinctive morphologies. It could be, for example, that individual reef types have different stages of development, like Darwin claimed, and this might result in a large variation in morphometric parameters. To characterize the morphology of each reef type, we collected four morphometric parameters along a one kilometer section of reef. First, we calculated the back reef area. This is bounded by the crest line on one side and the back reef slope break on the other. This slope break marks the transition into the lagoon, which is quite easy to define because it's commonly a seagrass meadow. Second, we did the same thing for the reef front. In this case, the reef front break marks a transition into the bedrock shelf, which is also easy to define due to changes in the roughness of the substrate. Third, we measured the distance from the crest line to the mid-shelf slope break. Now, this slope break is a fossil shoreline that developed during the early Holocene when sea level is about 18 meters below present. So it's common in all areas and occurs at the same depth and is easy to recognize on Google Earth. This distance between the crest line and the mid-shelf break represents the reef front slope. So a short distance means a steep slope and a long distance means a more gentle slope. The fourth and final parameter we measured was the sinuosity of the crest line along the entire reef, not just the one kilometer section. There were several limitations in collecting these data. First, you need clear and high resolution images. Unfortunately, this isn't always the case and the geomorphic features are often obscured, as you can see on these consecutive images of the same area. On the right, in the 2018 image, you can define the crest line, but not much else. In the 2020 image next to it, you can start to see shallow geomorphic features on the four reef shelf, like the spur and groove, but the deeper features are still unclear. Finally, it's only in the 2021 image that you can clearly see all features and measure all four morphometric parameters. So this lack of clear imagery basically means that of the 1,000 or so reefs that we counted, only 180 or so were clearly visible, which is about 18% of the total. In addition, several isolated areas had no imagery whatsoever, but luckily these areas are small and only, around, only amount to about 5% of the reefs. The last problem is that these 180 reefs aren't really an adequate sample of all the common reef types and only give us a su sufficient data to analyze about seven, seven of these reef types. So this means we can't compare the morphology of all reef types in all settings, in all ecozones. But what we can do is determine the amount of morphological variation in each reef type. And this will help us identify those with distinct morphologies, which we can then compare.
OK, so what are the results of measuring these four morphometric parameters in the 180 so reefs that we could clearly see? This graph shows kernel density estimates, which is a fancy kind of histogram that allows us to visualize the degree of morphological variation within each reef type. It shows the back reef and reef front areas and the steepness of the reef front slope for seven of the nine common reef types. And these are either unimodal with relatively narrow dispersions, representing reef types with a limited amount of morphological variation, or polymodal with wider dispersions, which represent reef types with a much larger morphological variation. The main thing you can see is that flat types seem to have a lower amount of internal variation than compared to crest types. The three flat types at the top have normal or unimodal distributions. They have similar central tendencies and they have narrower dispersions. Whereas the three crest types at the bottom have polymodal distributions, suggesting they may have different morphological variants within the group. So this basically shows that the morphology of flat types is more constrained and distinctive when compared to crest types. If we actually look at the numbers and consider the mean morphometric variation, we can get an idea of how the flat and the crest types compare. You can clearly see in the table that the three flat types at the top have narrow reef fronts with a shorter, steeper slope and a much larger back reef area and more sinuous crest line. Crest types, on the other hand, seem to be more variable, but generally have similar sized reef front and back reef areas, a more gentle reef front slope and straighter crest lines. So from this limited amount of data, we can already identify two reef morphotypes. Flat morphotypes with more distinctive morphometrics that reflect sinuous reefs with narrow steep reef fronts and large back reef areas. And crest morphotypes with more variable morphometrics, which are generally straighter with equal sized back reef and reef front areas. OK, let's bring these results together and try and figure out what they all mean. First, the distribution of reef types shows flat type reefs are abundant in southern eco regions but rare in the north. But we don't know why. Second, the morphological data shows flat type reefs have a more uniform morphology that is different from crest, crest type reefs. Again, we don't know why. So on the face of it, these findings imply that flat and crest type reefs may be two different reef types rather than Darwin's single type with different stages. However, our data relate to abundance and distribution of morphology. There's no environmental data such as wave energy or hurricanes that can help us explain these differences. So for this reason, we can't answer the why questions. But what we can do is consider other types of data from these reefs that can help us generate testable answers. So are there any additional data that we can use to either support or refute the claim that there are two reef types? Well, actually there is. Reconstructions of the internal structure of reefs documented by drilling studies. These reconstructions can help us formulate our hypothesis because a single reef type with different stages should share a similar internal structure, whereas two different reef types should have different internal structures. So let's take a brief look at the internal structures of flat versus crest type reefs. One of the first reconstructions of the internal structure of reefs was done on a flat type reef at Galeta Point in Panama by McIntyre and Glynn in 1977. You can see the photo shows Ian McIntyre and his crew drilling on the reef flat that's only a few centimetres deep. They drilled six holes across the flat and three holes down the reef front to provide a complete profile of the reef's internal structure. And these cores were logged and radiocarbon dated to produce the reconstruction. It shows the reef is dominated by thickets of the reef crest coral Acapora pomata. And these thickets started growing about 8,000 years ago and accreted vertically 15 metres in the subsequent 5,000 years, keeping pace with a slowly rising sea level. So flat type reefs show a simple model of vertical accretion. What about crest type reefs? There have been quite a few reconstructions, but the most detailed is from a fringing reef at Punta Maroma in the Mexican Caribbean, which I published in 2017. This reconstruction is based on 12 drill cores, 
Two of these were drilled at the seawage edge, edge of the reef front and recovered Pleistocene bedrock. But the other ten that are shown here recovered a unit composed of a large class of Acropora palmata, interspersed with rare head corals. And when we dated these cores, they gave an age range of between 7 to 2,000 years. But rather than showing a normal sequence that gets younger in an up upward direction, all cores had significant age reversals. And this suggests that the class were transported prior to deposition rather than just collapsing in place. So this gives us a good indication that the reef's internal structure is a detrital deposit and not composed of coral framework. This shows the final reconstruction of reef accretion through time based on the dated cores. The age variation between cores seems to indicate that reef accretion began in the middle of the reef front five to six thousand years ago when sea level was about three meters lower than today. From that point reef accretion was lateral in both landward and seaward directions but most was landward and proceeded by gradually retrograding over its back reef through time. But why should this be? Why is this lateral accretion pattern so different from the vertical accretion in the Panama example? And why is the reef composed of class rather than in place corals? Well, the answer is that this hurricane model of reef accretion is radically different because it's controlled by hurricanes, not the growth of coral framework. It stems from the fact that hurricane waves are big and a category 4 to 5 hurricane can generate waves as large as 15 to 20 meters. As these big waves move over the shelf towards the reef, they suddenly feel the seabed at the mid-shelf break, which causes them to spill and break over the reef front. These breaking waves destroy all corals growing there and deposit the fragments in a submerged storm ridge at a fixed distance from the mid-shelf break. And this distance represents the potential of these large and powerful hurricane waves to transport the coral fragments upslope towards the shore. Now after the hurricane is over, corals recolonize the storm ridge and the reef gradually recovers through time until the next big hurricane hits. And then the process, this process is repeated over thousands of years. As a consequence, this cycle of destruction and recovery, along with a gradual rise in sea level, produces a layer of reef crest rubble that retrogrades over its back reef through time. But how do we know that this retrograde accretion model applies to other crest type reefs in the Caribbean. Well if you look at the setback distance between the mid shelf slope break and the crest line on different reefs around the Caribbean you can see that it's a constant distance of between 3 to 400 meters which is the same as Ponta Maroma. So this implies that hurricane waves control the position of the crest type reefs by transporting coral clasts a similar distance up slope from the mid shelf slope break in all areas. So it seems that in addition to the differences in morphology and distribution, crest type and flat type reefs also have different internal structures. These differences therefore allow us to formulate some hypotheses to explain why these two reef morphotypes exist in the Caribbean. The first hypothesis is hurricanes. If crest type reefs are controlled by hurricanes as their internal structure suggests, then what predictions can we make about their distribution? Well, the first and most obvious is that the distribution of crest type should be positively correlated with the frequency of large hurricanes since these will destroy more coral. And the corollary is that they'll be absent in areas with low hurricane frequency. A second prediction is that the distribution of flat type reefs should be negatively correlated with hurricane frequency with a corollary that they may occur in locations with hurricane protection. So in other words, the distribution of these two reef types should be almost mutually exclusive with mixing only occurring as a result of local protection. Now to the right you can see probability maps generated from historical hurricane frequency. The upper shows hurricanes are, most, are common in most areas but the lower shows that big hurricanes are only common in central and northern areas. Now if you compare the probability map of intense hurricanes with the distribution of reef types, it shows that crest type reefs dominate where intense hurricanes are most frequent in eco zones 1, 2, 3 and 4 in the northwest. Whereas flat type reefs dominate where intense hurricanes are less common in eco zones 5, 6, 7 and 8 in the southeast. 
So this is exactly what you'd expect if hurricanes control the development and distribution of crest-type reefs. But what about flat-type reefs? They're not affected by hurricanes, so what controls their development? Well, you can see from the sea surface temperature data on the right that the Southern Caribbean has a smaller annual temperature range than the North by about 4 degrees. So a competing hypothesis might be that flat-type reefs require a reduced temperature range to develop. It might be, for example, that flat-type development is controlled by stenothermic reef benthos like crustose coralline algae, which seem to be less abundant in the north, where the annual temperature range is much larger. So these differences might produce reefs with a different morphology, because crustose corallines play an important role in binding the reef together, and might facilitate vertical growth by stabilising and producing steeper slopes. Therefore, a corollary of this is that the benthic ecology of flat type and crest type reefs will be different, which we can test by including these data in the analysis. So let's wrap this up and briefly summarise what we've found so far. We've used a new classification to categorise and count all surface reefs in the Caribbean. And we've measured 18% of them for the geomorphic variation. We found 16 reef types in total, 9 of which are fairly common. 80% of these are fringing reefs which dominate all areas, and 20% are barrier reefs, pharaohs and atolls. A key finding is that two types, flat and crest type reefs, have different morphologies, occur in different areas and seem to have different internal structures. And we've hypothesised that these differences may be related to either a northern increase in hurricane frequency or a sudden reduction in the annual temperature range, or both. To test these preliminary explanations, we need to introduce environmental and ecological data into the analysis. And that will be our next step. So what conclusions can we draw from these findings? Darwin couldn't identify barriers and atolls in the Caribbean for two reasons. First, he naturally assumed they'd look similar to Indo-Pacific reefs he was used to, but found they didn't and had puzzling differences. Second, he assumed there'd be a single reef type with superficially similar stages, but instead found that the surface of atolls and barriers weren't similar at all. He never considered for one minute that there might be more than one reef type present in the Caribbean. And for the last 180 years, this preoccupation with Darwin's single reef type has remained the ruling paradigm. And different looking reefs are considered to be the successional or developmental stages of a single reef type. For example, ecological variation between reefs is commonly seen as intrinsic succession from pioneer to climax stages, with disturbance interrupting or resetting the sequence. As Tom Garrow said, modern reefs are not stable and mature communities, but are undergoing successional changes typical of youthful assemblages. And the same is true in reef geology, where geomorphic variation is viewed as a progression of developmental stages controlled by extrinsic drivers, such as substrate conditions or sea level change. But what if at least some of this ecological and geomorphic variation was instead due to the development of different reef types under different environmental conditions? So our findings clearly upset this ruling paradigm by showing that there are at least two different kinds of breakwater reef in the Caribbean. And these occur in different areas, they have different morphologies and different internal structures. Those in the north seem to be controlled by hurricane impact and have morphologies and internal structures that are quite different from those in the Indo-Pacific. Whereas those in the south are less impacted by hurricanes and have morphologies and internal structures that are quite similar to those in the Indo-Pacific. Now we're not saying that reefs with different stages don't occur, and it seems likely that the variation in the morphology, for example, that we've seen in crest-type reefs, may represent just that. But if there is more than one reef type, and these are controlled by different environmental processes, then they should have significant ecological and geological differences. So we seem to have generated more questions than we've actually answered. It seems that our ignorance about reefs has increased. To remedy the situation, our next step will be to test the link between reef morphology 
and environmental processes. We look at the relation between reef morphometrics and hurricane wave exposure. We'll also look at the benthic ecology of these two reef types and attempt to figure out if the annual temperature variation plays a role.